a lot of struggles with these small and mid-sized organizations. Right. It's, it's not just about telling them what's wrong. <laughs> they need to know what, what they need to be able to do. Hey everybody, Brian Hoagley here. Welcome back to CISO Life. Excited today have with a special guest out of our friends from the North, Vancouver, BC, specifically Dominic Vogel joins us today. And we're going to talk about, guess what? Cyber stuff. So Dominic, welcome to the show. Thanks for uh, thanks for making the time today. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. Really looking forward to this convo. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know if there's a difference between the cyber community in Canada versus the United States, but um, I mean, I've been following you here um, from from here, but um, you know, why don't you share a bit about yourself? Where, where do you where are you coming from? What are you looking to do? What's your uh, what are your passions? Yeah, the, the, I mean, I, I really don't think there's, there's much of a difference between I think, a, you know, security person is a security person. Only difference sure. is, I guess, our, our health care is covered here in Canada. The only <laughs> thing I, I can think of is maybe the, the difference. But, uh, um, you know, I, uh, in terms of sort of uh, my career journey, you know, I always tell people that there's been two versions of me. There was corporate me. And then there's entrepreneurial me. So that's the current version that you're speaking with. Nice. <laughs> the first ten, 10 years of my career was corporate me, you know, and I always thought I was someone who was going to climb the corporate ladder and have a you know, 25, 30 year career in, in, in corporate. And um, I ended up being in charge of cybersecurity for a credit union here in, in, in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And um, it was one day I had this epiphany. I was like, I'm going every day was the same. I would be in at seven in meetings from seven till five at night. And at every night when I would be driving home, I'd be thinking to myself, what the hell did I get done today? <laughs> I feel like I was just uh, stuck in this, in this cycle and nothing productive was being done. And it's been really amazing, this self-discovery journey about learning more about who I am uh, as, a, as a person. Uh, I never thought I was an extroverted person. I was someone who was very introverted, head down, doing his work, doing his thing. Uh, I didn't really like talking with people. So it, it's been really interesting seeing this person that uh, I didn't know was inside me. So it's been very fulfilling from that point of view and just from a secure perspective. You know, I love being able to provide what I feel is great pragmatic leadership and cyber risk guidance to small and mid-sized organizations. You know, it's uh, they're the ones who I think need it the most and struggle in order to get good advice. And uh, so I'm, I'm very thankful to, to be in a position where, where we're able to work with them. What what does the Canadian market look like? You know that you're seeing from your vantage point. Yeah, you know, especially with the with the mid market, it's been interesting seeing that evolve over time. You know, uh, for the most part, I'd say up until probably the past few years, a lot of mid market organizations were relying mainly on sort of your traditional big four, so like relying on a Deloitte or KPMG or right. or what have you. And again, those shops are really well orchestrated to be able to serve, I think, larger organizations. Mm -hmm. A lot of the smaller and uh, mid-sized organizations, um, it didn't, and what I heard, I've heard consistently quite a bit is that they'll engage with, you know, again, one of the big auditing firms, but that the outcome doesn't fit a mid-market or a smaller organization. They'll end up with this really fancy report with all these fancy colors telling them all the things that are wrong, but it's lacking in pragmatism. And that's where uh, there's a lot of struggles with these small and mid-sized organizations. Right. Which it's, it's not just about telling them what's wrong. <laughs> they need to know what, what they need to be able to do. And, uh, um, you know, I think what we've seen in the Canadian market over the, over the past little while is that um, we've seen other boutique-style uh, consulting shops uh, pop up as well to be able to help serve the mid market, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I still see it as being chronically underserved. In which yeah. uh, you see, I would say these enterprise offerings trying to be somewhat stripped down and offered to mid market, and that that's what I was custom filled. That's what I was going to ask you. You know, when you talk about the big four approach to consulting, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. No, for yep. enterprise, right? Yeah. But you can't necessarily take an enterprise view and approach. And and necessarily scale it correctly to that mid market. So like it's interesting to hear you say like not only the the tech, right? Like you kind of just that last point you made, but even the the upfront consulting and the approach to the understanding the issue and then trying to solve the issue, you actually have to kind of go in maybe with a different type of mindset, and that different mindset might be a different type of culture, right? Big mm -hmm. fours have a have a culture, right? They've yeah. got a very set culture on how to do things. That culture might not even be the right way to look at the mid market. Um, and small businesses, which, you know, maybe that doesn't even get to, I don't even think that gets talked about enough. It's mostly like, oh, we yep. can't make this enterprise technology work for a small business. But mm -hmm. 
can you make enterprise consulting work for small business? And 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 that's such a good point, Brian. And, and it's and it's not brought up. You know, it, it's uh, very rarely do you see that as a conversation or a dialogue item anywhere. And uh, again, it's just even taking an, a service offering, whether it be a technology or a, a service or consulting approach, and trying to sort of uh, shoehorn it in and make it fit mm -hmm. in a, a setting where it wasn't really designed to uh, to work. And uh, what I hear from a lot of mid-sized um, and smaller organizations is that. Uh, really what they really need guidance on is more hand-holding in terms of what should they be pri prioritizing, how can they be road mapping, uh, right. what items should they be focusing on, not so much again that big enterprise approach of here's everything, let's look at all the things. They would uh, with small um, mid-market, they'd rather know what are the things we should focus on this year right. uh, rather than the, 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 the whole big picture because the whole big picture is very overwhelming for them. They don't sure. have a an, uh, they don't have an enterprise risk committee or an audit committee where right. that report will go up to and, and 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 such. Yeah, the um I um because we seem to tackle the same kind of spheres now, right? Of of clientele. Um, I really always kind of push when people are like, "Well, what's the roadmap going to look like? What are we going to craft at?" I was like, "Nothing longer than eighteen months." Like yeah. that's the that's really kind of where you guys should be focusing. Six months, really. 18 yeah. months max, like, let's yeah. not get carried away because that's not got crazy. <laughs> yeah. By six or 12 months into it, those last six months are probably changing anyway. Cause you know, they're smaller companies are nimble. They might've changed direction, a startup, you know, working with startups and product companies like that. They, they pivot all the time, you know, you, yeah. you've, and you've got to, you know, almost flow, you know, with them. And, uh, there's not this overarching strategic five-year plan for dominance, right? Mm -hmm. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a six so month true. plan for, uh, you know, you know, top line and uh, ARR, right? That's the, yep. that's kind of what I've seen. So that's, uh, well, that's good to hear. You know, it's, um, you know, I, we, you know, Magna Celli, she's out of Singapore. Um, yep. Yep. She, it's, it's interesting. I kind of had the same conversation with her because I was genuinely curious. I was like, in APAC, like, what are you seeing? Is it the same? And she's focusing on that same space, the same issues. And it's the same narrative. It's the same issues. Yep. It's the same story, um, you know, that, that you and I are encountering. So, well, I guess everybody's in good company across the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a similar narrative, just different backdrops, I guess, right? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. What's, um, what's one of the things that you're seeing that, um, you know, like top level risk that you're kind of seeing maybe across clientele or kind of you feel like you're going into, you know, these mid-market and small businesses and you're like, Oh, I I bet I know what the top risk is, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it in the back of my head. And you sit down with the client, and you get through, and you figure it out, and you start them on their path. And it's like, oh, guess what the top one is? What are you seeing? Yeah. Are you seeing any kind of like similarities across everyone? Yeah, there are some similarities, and again, I wouldn't necessarily necessarily map them back to external threats like ransomware, business email compromise. Right, right. I'd say it's even more more inward facing stuff. Uh, uh, the two ones which which I see consistently. One is. Uh, well referred to as a false sense of security. So you'll have, again, the business owner, the CEO, CFO, again, ultimately whoever cyber risk falls upon, mm -hmm. they're still thinking of the mindset, which I refer to as being stuck in 1995, in which they'll say, well, we know not to fall for the Nigerian print scam. We, we have Norton 360. Uh, why do we need to be spending money on this? This, this is a waste of money. You know, uh, yeah. cyber, you know these criminals aren't going to come after us. I'm uh, not a target, right? I'm not a target, exactly. And, yeah. and again, if this was if we if we were having that conversation, it was 1995. Yeah, I'd be hard pressed to argue with them. But I always tell people, you know what? It's 2020. You know, the Spice Girls aren't relevant anymore. So you you know you need to realize that things change, things evolve. Um, cyber security as a whole and cyber risk has evolved as a whole as well. So the that predominant mindset. And it's still very predominant in the SMB community mm -hmm. uh, with with so many uh, business executives that it's the this this is something that we shouldn't be worried about. And I always push to them. I say, you know what? Look at the past five uh, World Economic Forum reports about risks globally, worldwide. What's consistently in the top three or top five there? Cyber risk. Right. Uh, you know, this isn't something which is make believe. This isn't some conspiracy thing. Uh, you know, this is real. You as an organization need to deal with it. So I'd say number one uh, is that mindset uh, at the executive level. Uh, number two is what I refer to as a misalignment mm -hmm. between uh, the executive leadership and IT. 
So whether that be IT is fulfilled internally, whether they have an IT, you know, quote, unquote, guy or the guy's brother-in-law or whatever, <laughs> it depends on the, on the organization, uh, or if they're relying on an IT managed service provider. Right. What I see so much there is this, what I refer to as blind trust, in which if we talk to, uh, again, the, uh, the business owner or an executive, and we talk about cyber risk, they say, well, if something happens, it's, it's up to the IT manager. It's on our IT managed service provider. It's uh, it's on them. Right. And you know we're, we we don't worry about that risk because they take care of it. And again, there's that misalignment. And, I, and if I say, well, how do you know that they're taking care of cybersecurity? What questions are you asking? How are you holding them accountable? And they're, they're not able to answer that. And if right. you watch some of those conversations, generally speaking, you know the the IT team or the IT managed service provider is speaking in pure tech talk. Right. And then you have the um, uh, the business just just nodding because they don't want to appear to be foolish in the face of that conversation. They're just blindly uh, nodding along. So that misalignment there is one of the uh, again I'd say one of the most prevalent things that I see with SMBs. Hmm. That misalignment is a very very dangerous gap. Oh, I I agree. You know, I what I love out of both of these, um, I agree with you, is that neither one of these are necessarily technology. No, right. yeah. this is this is this is human behavior. It's like this yeah. is like business risk acceptance or understanding first and yeah. foremost, right? Yeah. Then then comes and um, I, I feel like a lot of the the discussions that have been happening predominantly in the last probably two years that I've like watched is more and more of the I think the folks who know what they're talking about with this is the basics, basic hygiene, mindset like alignment to, you know, to business, business risk and that. And uh, I'm glad to see that that's the, you know, that that's the discussions that are happening, but I still don't see the acceptance of that. You know, um, I, I'll share, you know, five, five years ago when I left DOD, um, you know, the, the CEO that I was talking with, you know, initially first days in the job as a CISO, he he genuinely was like, I don't know why you're here. Like, I don't know why we need this role. Why do we got to focus on security? And I was like, what? Like, are you, it's 2015. Like, you're in the Fortune 500, you know? And then, what was it, last year, you know, I, I go ahead and and start reading, you know, I, I started kind of refollowing some of the Fortune 500, you know, specific news. And it was like, Two thirds of the Fortune 500, or 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 somewhere close to that, didn't even have a CISO. Yeah, mind blowing, <laughs> right? So for small businesses to still carry that type of thinking, right? Because look who they're looking at, right? They're looking upstream, yep. you know. And yep. if they're not setting a good example, um, mm -hmm. it makes sense that that's still, you know, that's still the the way that they're thinking about it. You know, I'm not a target. You know, we're just transfer the risk. And look, I'm all about insurance but not as not as the first resort, right? That's the the one you get yeah, to it, later. Exactly. I think again, the, the, back to that mindset piece in which um, there's you have people making cyber risk decisions who aren't, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, they're not competent enough to make those decisions. Sure. And again, it's not fair. It's not fair to them that they should be making those decisions. Right. Because they don't they don't really know what information and data points they need to make an optimum de uh, decision. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me where you see in organizations where ultimately the person who's responsible for cyber secure cyber risk is the CFO. They're yeah. not going to be making an optimum decision unless they're getting the right data points. Yeah. And in all likelihood, they're they're not getting the right data points, so they're going to make a less than optimum decision. And I agree with you. You know, enterprise for the most part isn't setting a good example. So why should you know an SMB uh, uh, do things any, any any different? You know, so it's um, it's fine. Which it's still we're still very much in this reactive state, mm -hmm. and something which I've I've recently started to do with with our business in which. We try to teach proactive. You know, all of our messaging and uh, marketing was all about proactive security. Uh, guess what? That led to like zero client growth. <laughs> right. We 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 changed the messaging to about you know come to us uh, reactively after something bad happens. Yeah, we saw phenomenal client growth. Sure. <laughs> you know, it's uh, uh, as cyber security professionals, you and I obviously would prefer it to be uh, proactive. Right. But it's just. For whatever reason, the market still is stuck in this reactive mindset, and yeah. I, I foresee us being stuck in a more reactive mindset for still many years to come. Yeah, 
you know, as a, as you mentioned that example and you you got to CFO, like as you started talking about that, all I had in my head was like, oh man, I should bring up the CFO example I have. And <laughs> you beat me to it. And I was like, oh, all right. Isn't that sad? I'm like, oh, nothing against CFOs, right? Like, but you're right. Like they're, they're somehow like saddled with the responsibility, but they don't yep. have the, they're, they're, they don't have the right expertise. And, and, yep. you know, if any CFOs are watching this again, don't take this the wrong way, but think about it in the other, you know, if, if it was flipped, if I was a CIO for an organization and we didn't have a CFO and suddenly all the yep. financial decisions came to me, would it be smart of me to not seek the advice of financial advisors? Yep. Right. I do this with, I tell people this with lawyer, like the, the legal example all the time. It's like, I'm not a lawyer. I've spent enough time with lawyers being a CISO and, and having been around that and needing that, but I still seek their advice on legal opinions because they're the experts. I'm not right. We need to start to, you know, craft the role, the higher level roles uh, of security to embrace that as well that type of professional view of you don't need to have all the answers and like one of the things out of CISO life was like you don't need to know everything like let's talk about all the places you should be going to and talking to and making friends with to like get that you know get that information so you could be successful at your job because you shouldn't think that you have to do it alone and it's unfortunate that a lot of CISOs out there do um ask for help guys girls it's okay go just go just go do it oh man it, 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 and it's, um, I can't remember where I read this, but, you know, one of the things that again, our profession as a whole hasn't done a good enough job of, um, I think why I think there's still some uh, myths that uh, stick around, is that so many of us uh, in security leadership roles uh, view security as almost like a moral imperative. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not that, you know, and, and when people don't, you know, the CFO, CEO, CEO, whomever, decide to go on another path. So many of us take it personally. And, you know, we, we take a scorch earth type policy uh, to, what, to when things don't go our, our, our way. And it's important to understand that at the end of the day, we are just providing um, uh, basically uh, risk advisory uh, mm-hmm. uh, capabilities to the ultimate decision makers. Right. You know, in, uh, ultimately, in any organization, you know, CISO isn't the final decision maker for that risk you know right. they, they in, in, in any capacity in my mind they are the chief advisor to the final decision makers from a cyber risk and information risk perspective right. uh yeah they may be the final decision maker in their in their um in their vertical there but but not within the organization and uh, i think that's a, a reason why and i've heard this from many uh you know ceos cfos in terms of i say why don't you seek out uh, uh um you know experts in that space and for, you know, I kid you not, I get reasons which, oh, you know, security people are arrogant. They're boring. I don't know what they're talking about. They take things too personally. Uh, again, it's a lot of it is stereotypical, but the fact is we're not, many of us aren't doing ourselves any favors. Right. And it, preve- it prevents the, you know, the right people uh, to be able to get the right messaging uh, out. So, um, you know, often, uh, I'm not sure about you, but I know for, for, for us, when we're engaging with, with potential clients, we have to spend a lot of time almost paying for the sins of those who came before us yeah. in terms of telling them this is why we're different we're not going to make you uh, uh want to run uh, run and run away screaming from us you know we're we're on your side kind of thing so right. it's, um i think it's the thing as a whole as an industry we need to all be better communicators yeah definitely i mean from the entrepreneurial side you, you know that's that's kind of almost you know going to determine the success of your business is being able to do that you know in a full-time role um it's probably just going to determine your career, right? Like you're not yep. going to be able yep. to go to the next place if you were seen as any of those things at the last, at the last role. Right. Um, yep. You know, t- um, it, it's interesting. Like I, uh, I've kind of always said, like, I don't, I don't actually sell security to anybody. Like I'm not in a position where I'm like trying to convince you that you need us. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I like to be in a position where it's like, you understand that you have a risk and now you're seeking the right advice. Um, yeah. So it's kind of this post, it, sometimes it's post, post breach, right? Like post breach yeah. being like, all right, the janitors came through, everything's cleaned up. You kind of got everything back to order. But now you're in this position where you're like, man, I do not want to go through that again. You know, if you're watching or listening, like the, the message I think really is, is like, don't be afraid to ask for help. For help. And, yeah, and I totally. think, I think the ways to, you know, approach things now that I've been seeing that some success is, 
you know, this fractional availability, right? Um, the mid market doesn't need a full time person necessarily. Small businesses yeah. definitely do not. But you know, you can tap into, you know, firms like yours, like mine, like like others who are making these services available at scale, right? That that small mid sized businesses can financially digest. Um, has that something that you've seen kind of a more of an uptick? Because before the, the thinking was just like, oh, I need a full time person. I can't yeah. afford a full time person. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. And then the problem is just still a problem. And they don't get addressed. But now, you know, it's more like, you know, there's more, you know, the Ubers of security, right? Like yeah. people becoming available, more, more availability. What what are your thoughts on kind of that market and, and how that's gone? Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's interesting. We, we, we've, we've seen that emerge in the Canadian market as well in which uh, even during COVID, I think COVID has helped to serve as a positive accelerant in terms of almost a greater acceptance of fractional type services mm -hmm. or even retainer uh, uh, type services uh, as it pertains to, to cyber risk leadership. And um, you know, especially uh, like even given, given the Vancouver market as an example, uh, like you were saying there, there's a small, there's already a small talent pool when it comes to uh, to uh, qualified security leaders at, at a leadership level. Mm -hmm. Generally, those are going to be at either at the very uh, high levels in, in public sector, or they'll uh, be snatched up in, uh, in enterprise roles. So that doesn't, even just from a resource perspective, even yeah. if the mid market or the small small companies wanted to hire them, they're not there. <laughs> right. Uh, and even if they were there, could they afford them? Uh, probably not. Not at a full time salary, and we consider all the benefits and everything as well. And now it becomes very easy to make that almost that uh, uh, mathematical equation of showing, you know what. When it comes to tapping into that fractional uh, service from a CISO perspective, yeah, you can get that fraction of the cost. You're able to hit the ground running. You're able to tap into a stable of leadership uh, for the fraction of the cost of what it would cost to just have one person there full time. So mm -hmm. it's it's really really uh, quite um, eye opening. I think once you're able to to have those conversations with with, with people, and at least in the Canadian market, a lot of people were very skeptical of sort of that virtual service in which is like oh you know what we want you in the office at least once or twice yeah. a week you know there's that 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 mindset that there's no value unless someone's butt is physically in a seat right uh and because of covid i think covid has really um opened the eyes to a lot of non-believers in which work can get done virtually someone can be in the bahamas someone can be working at home someone can be wh wherever that working from anywhere whether it be your employees or other services that that, that you leverage they don't have to physically be there. So yeah. at least here, we've seen uh, easier discussions now that people aren't questioning sort of the virtual model. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, so it's the same thing that, you know, I've, I've definitely seen here. You, so you made the transition, right, um, from enterprise to running your own firm. And I'd love to, you know, I've, I get a lot of folks who want to join side channel or just want to talk about kind of striking out on their own. And everyone's got kind of their different motivations. But you know, not necessarily what your motivation was, but when you made that transition, you know, what was the work-life balance that you sought out for yourself? Because I got to believe, like I did, I had this thing in my head where I was like, well, if I'm going to go strike out on my own, I'm going to make my own hours. I'm going to set yeah. some level of, you know, like I'm going to be in a little bit more control of my life, um, yeah. which I'm glad I did. Um and that's kind of something that I know some people seek, but they don't know how to do it. What What are your thoughts on that? And any advice to people out there who are looking to get into consulting and kind of do work like this? You know, like what kind of guide rails should they set for themselves? That, that's a really great question, Brian. And, and uh, a quick plug for myself. I actually gave a talk at InfoSec World uh, you know, virtually. I was supposed to go to Disney World, but thanks to COVID, we didn't. Uh, but it was it was it was uh, na uh, navigating my personal story of leaving enterprise and start going on my uh, on my personal journey, uh, what I refer to as my BC so journey. And uh, I'll actually be sharing that presentation on my LinkedIn some point in August. So uh, excellent, love it. But people people can can listen to that that full. Um, uh, presentation, but uh, in terms of again going out on your own, uh, yeah, you know, if, for someone who never saw themselves as an entrepreneur, uh, it was definitely scary. <laughs> uh, I never, I didn't even know what the word entrepreneur really, really meant. You know, um, I mean, I knew the def, you know, the Webster's definition of it, but I didn't know what it, what it, what it meant. And in terms of those guardrails, uh, what I really suggest people do uh, and look at when they do go out on their own is to first understand what your own risk tolerance is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, are, are, you know, are, if you're not able to get 
income for maybe six months. Is that okay? Do you have savings? Does your spouse or significant other, do, do they work? Um, don't just necessarily take a, a plunge. For me, what I did my first year uh, when I was on my own, I took a contract of fully remote work and I was able to work on that in the morning. And then I was able to work on my company and start you know, actually planning out what I wanted to do and that type of thing in the, in the afternoon. At least that way, uh, because I, uh, my wife doesn't work, uh, that allowed us to, to have you know stable uh, stable income. So my, my first suggestion, like I said, is there uh, know what your risk tolerance is in terms of uh, taking that that jump. Hmm. That the, the second guardrail is uh, being productive with your time. Uh, one of the first things that I did when I um, when I left was I wanted to figure out what it is that I wanted to do. Who is it that I wanted to help? Uh, and you know, going back to that, why, why am I doing what I want to do? Right. Uh, answer those questions. Some people, uh, like being able to work with large clients. Some people like to work with startups. Some people only like to work with tech companies. Some people want to get into the weeds when it comes to doing security implementation. Other people just want to focus on strategy and leadership. Uh, figure that stuff out. Don't try and be everything to everyone. Mm. Uh, because when you do that, you end up just in a maze and you'll get stuck in that rat race again and you'll be really, really frustrated and pissed off. <laughs> so uh, don't, don't do that. Um, and the third guardrail is don't chase the money. Uh, there's no short, just like there's no shortage of bad employers, there's no shortage of bad clients. Right. One of the earliest mistakes that I made was that, especially early on in, in, in my entrepreneurial journey, was that anytime anyone showed interest, I would bend over backwards and try and make them a client. I'd make uh, concessions. I would charge less, I, whatever, just to have a client. All Every time I did that, those people ended up being really crappy clients. Huh. Uh, when I realized that you know I need to know what my self-worth is, I need to know what my non-negotiables are, right. uh, and that uh, I left corporate for a reason. I left corporate so I didn't have to work with jerks anymore. If I don't like someone, uh, then I don't want you as a client, you know, <laughs> yeah. I only like being around awesome people. That's one of the reasons why I left corporate. That's so why I didn't have to be stuck with people who I didn't have to be, uh, be around. So, um, don't chase the money. Money, uh, is, is never the answer. Uh, when you stick to your principles and chase what I refer to as your awesome vision, what it is that you truly want to do? The money will always be there. Nice. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. Uh, I mean, I wish I would have talked to you a year ago. Uh, <laughs> No, that's that's really good because I've learned a couple of those things along the way. So uh, yeah. that's excellent. That's excellent. How do you um? How do you? So obviously, you know, you, you don't you can't be like you said uh, everything to everybody, right? So, um, you know, one of the things is being kind of like a you know outsourced consultant or or you know coming in as a leader like this for these firms, not being everything, right? You you've got to build kind of a partnership and a circle of partners that you can bring in to meet those needs, right? So you're not running an MSSP. And I mean, unless you are, but I don't think. No, like, no. So <laughs> you've got to find those MSSPs, right, to bring in. And it's an interesting thing. Like as a CISO in a full-time role, you've got to vet these groups, go through procurement, do all this, and then bring them into the company to, to service you. As an outsourced, you know, leader or CISO or, you know, however it, it's structured, you know, strategic advisor sometimes for companies, You've got to, you know, do that as well and then bring them with you or bring them in if you're already, you know, you already have that client set up as a client. What are you looking for out of those? And we can just take an MSSP as maybe one specific example. Um, You know, sometimes it's a specific product, but, you know, what are you looking for out of those partnerships with those firms that you can highlight, you know, to your client? And then what are you just looking for? you know, from your business, from your personal professional view with that other firm so that you're like, Hey, look, I, n- I want to continue to do business with you. I want to go to market with you. Right. Um, you know, what are the things you're looking for out of them? Cause there's a ton of MSSPs, right. Just yeah. looking at an example, a ton <laughs> yeah, of them a dozen. in this market. Yeah. It's crazy. Right. Um, and yeah. you, you got to weed through it. So, yeah. you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? That, that, that's such a good question, you know, and, and, and core to how we've chosen to, to grow the business for the past five years organically is by investing in strategic relationships. Hmm. That's the ones which we've identified, again, MSSPs, uh, privacy professionals, forensic specialists, uh, implementation specialists. You know, you look at all the peripherals there, even app, things like application security, right? When you're able to uh, invest in those types of relationships, 
that really helps to organic to grow the business. Right. Using the uh, uh, MSSP example there, uh, gosh, they are a, truly a dime a dozen. And I kid you not, that has been a, uh, uh, almost chasing a holy grail of sorts in order to find one that we uh, truly wanted to partner with. Yeah. Uh, we actually recently uh, found one and it was actually an American organization in, in, in Utah. Couldn't find a good one in Canada here. <laughs> but, oh, uh, uh, <laughs> um, you know, what, what was, uh, to me, again, it's really about understanding and embracing the true word of partnership. Yeah. Uh, wh one of the things which drives me nuts, and I can't tell you how many times um, I I've heard this, is when I engage with a potential, what I feel may be a potential partnership opportunity, uh, I want people who have a relationship mentality, not a transactional mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, by transactional mentality, I mean there are those who are quick to say, oh, you know what? Let's sign a referral agreement. You send us stuff. You know, we'll get we'll get you ten percent, and uh, you send us stuff, and then we'll send you ten percent of, of of the deal there. And it's like you know, to me, that's transactional. You know, if we want to get that to that level of detail, fine, we can look at that down the road. But yeah. that's very transactional. Uh, to me, there's greater value in investing in that relationship. And by relationship, I mean mutual wins. What can we do at CyberSC to help you win? Uh, you know, MSSP, you know, provider X. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and conversely, this is what you can do to help us win here at, at CyberSC. When we when you help us win, we help you win. The client wins. That's what I refer to as a triple win. Yeah. Well, there's three, three, three wins there right across the board. Uh, when you take that relationship approach, it's much more positive. You build something much more um, optimum in terms of a, a, of a, you know, a coherent plan. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a, like I said, transaction. Transaction is right. short term uh, scarcity mindset thinking, in my, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, when you take that abundance mindset, and the ability to be able to build something from that, uh, I think that's very, very powerful. And then you unlock some pretty cool magic. And, uh, but you know, to me, it's all about making sure that you truly understand what it means to be uh, a partner. Because to me, I would have this uh, around uh, reciprocation, which there's greater value for me if we're able to send you a client, mm -hmm. and then somewhere down the road, you're able to send us a client. Getting a new client is worth way more to me over the course of 20 years rather than you sending me a check for 10% of some one-time deal. Yeah, right. um, so, I mean, on so many levels, both from an economic perspective and just from an altruistic perspective, it makes more sense to embrace a relational approach. So um, I gravitate to those who understand what it means to be a true partner and to take a, a relationship approach. I love that. Um, I'll, I'm going to throw you a bit of a curveball because this is something that is always, it's not fun to struggle with, but it's something I think that folks like you and myself do. So, you know, our roles, right, are being the strategic advisor, kind of the, you know, to the client, right? Yeah. And when we work with our partners and these folks to come in, say, we'll take MSSPs again as an example, and they fail to provide the value or fail on their promise to deliver. Our responsibility is still first and foremost to the client, right? We want to align ourselves. You, you want to align yourselves to the client first. You know, what, you know, I don't know, I'm just kind of throwing it out there, but like, the discussion when you're calling your partner to the mat, you yeah. know, at your client that they came in and they didn't deliver, right? Like doing that dance, like the alliance to me, right, is with the client, not to that yeah. partnership. Totally. Yeah. So, so how does that conversation go, right? And and you know, and maybe there's no answer, but it's just something to recognize <laughs> that that's the way it's supposed to be, everyone, yes. right? And that's yes. that is yeah. a difficult decision. It is going to happen, but that is the way it's supposed to be, right? The you're supposed to be aligned to the client, not to the partner first, you know. And yeah, maybe I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Because that's and I, I, I completely agree with you, Brian. When, when we're talking about where allegiance falls, there it has right. to fall on the client. You know, uh, th that that who is the, ultimately that's the per the group that's paying the money. <laughs> right. So, I mean, they're, they're the ones who need to, to, to see the results and, and uh, um, that, that only makes sense from that perspective. In terms of those conversations, uh, I always refer to you know, when we have a strategic partnership that we need to be each other's accountability partners. Mm. Uh, if we drop the ball somewhere, uh, we need to be called on the mat on that and then we're going to make a game plan in terms of how we're going to make that right. And I expect the same thing from uh, our partners, our strategic partners, if that something, if someone gets called, uh, on something, we want to make sure that that's uh, uh, sorted out, that that's brought into the light, that we address that again as professionals. We're not name calling, we're not pointing yeah. figures. It's like, you know what, something happened, the client was not happy, how do we address that? Um, you know, it, it's um, it's only happened once, <laughs> thankfully, uh, yeah. for us. 
uh, in which um, there was an IT, there weren't quite an MSSB, they were more of a managed service provider, didn't quite have a security portfolio uh, uh, wrapped up, but uh, um, they were they were they were brought in and they they would just you know uh, the, the client referred to them as a bunch of cowboys. Uh, and not in a good way. <laughs> you right. know, and, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it was, uh, we said, you know what, this, this can't continue. And, you know, we, we uh, had a discussion and we just ended up uh, parting ways because it, it just, it just uh, they were not willing to admit fault. And um, uh, one of the things which I talk about in, in my presentation as, as well is that uh, at the end of the day, you need to be, you need to embrace humility. Uh, and I recognize that on a daily basis, I screw up. My wife reminds me of that frequently, and uh, you know it's uh, it's something that uh, I look for in our partners. You know, I, yeah. there needs to be a sense of humility. It's okay to screw up, uh, sure. but what's not okay is to try and dig in your heels and try and make the problem worse. Um, it's bad enough that you know there's a, a person in the White Office, uh, White House, who <laughs> who takes that approach there uh, by digging in their heels. Uh, that's just our, my little Canadian sling at, at uh, <laughs> my. Uh, after my, uh, at, at the Americans, but um, you know, it, 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 you got to be humble. You know, yeah. uh, um, especially if you want to be seen as a trusted advisor, like, mm-hmm. like exactly you're saying there, Brian. At the end of the day, we're taking a trusted advisor approach. To me, a trusted advisor needs to have a strong sense of humility. Uh, right. Otherwise, how can you take someone at their word? Right. Exactly. I've uh, referred to or, or heard it called as an honest broker, right? And trusted advisor. Yeah. Which I, it's yeah. a very yeah very kind of sacred role and needs to be taken, you know, seriously and kind of needs to, you know, overcome, you know, really all those other things. We're, we're kind of at the, I want to be respectful of your time. I appreciate so much for you, you taking the time to, to spend with me um, and talk about this. I, I wanted to get into, you know, your presence on LinkedIn and uh, you know, like you're, you know, like 15,000 followers, I think is the last thing I saw. And like, you've got a good following and, and a significant, um, significantly good track of content, not just for the sake of content, like the way you talk, what you're talking about is, um, I think is phenomenal. And, uh, you know, I look forward to the thing coming out from InfoSec world. So please, um, do share that. I'll promote that. Um, comments down below for anyone, uh, you know, uh, on what we've talked about maybe we can get you back on and, uh, you know, talk some more about some of these things. I would love to, let's, let's, let's do a part two, Brian. And, I love it. And, and, and as well, uh, I would love to have you on our on our Canadian uh, Cybersecurity Matters podcast. Uh, I always love uh, interviewing amazing Americans, so I'd lo- love to have you on our show at some point as well. <laughs> Excellent. No, that'd be great. Um, listen, everyone, Brian Hoagley here with Dominic Vogel. Um, I appreciate you guys taking the time. Hopefully, you found this insightful. Uh, again, thanks for watching. Uh, check us out around social media. Follow us via hashtag CISOLife. You can check out Dominic on LinkedIn as well. And we will catch you next time, all right? Everyone take care. Bye.